Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are starting the session of this afternoon of the second workshop in computational chemistry as a tool to develop strategic materials. Uh, we will have in this afternoon four presentations, three of students at, from the Fluminense Federal University and one from Professor Andrew Paluk from the University of Miami. Uh, we hope you have a very exciting afternoon with these four talks uh, that are, I consider from very important people. Uh, we are starting those with the, the presentation from the students from UF. Uh, we start with Karine Nascimento de Andrade. Karine uh, is, is a PhD student at the Fluminense Federal University. She, he grad, she graduated from the, this university, uh, where she has, all, uh, has done his uh, graduate student in, in Master Science under the supervision of Professor Leonardo Costa. She is currently a PhD student working under the supervision of Professor Rodolfo Fioro. Uh, her experience is in the field of molecular simulation with an emphasis on organic chemistry, specifically in reaction mechanisms. Uh, and now she is a student in classical mechanism in organic chemistry with the emphasis on hydrolysis and solvent effects. For this, the talk in this afternoon, she will speak about hydrolysis of alkyl halides and specifically the influence of water solvation models on the SNX mechanism. Please, Karine, the, uh, start with your presentation. Hello, everyone. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. So, hello, my name is Karine de Andrade, and today I will present a part of my research titled Hydrolysis of Alkyl Halides, the influence of water salvation models on the SNX mechanism, and I am advised by Professor Rodolfo Fiorat. So I will start with a short introduction about solvolysis mechanism, in special SN1 and SN2 mechanism, and then I will present my main goals and computational details. My results are organized into sections. The first one uh, about the influence of number and configuration of the explicit solvent. And then I will talk about reaction mechanism type from TS nature. I will finish with some final remarks and future expectations. So SN1 and SN2 are classic organic reaction mechanism. Despite that, the, the studies about reaction mechanism of alkyl halide solvolysis as hydrolysis, in which the solvent is water, is underexplored in atomic level. This reaction has a huge influence of the computational treatment of solvent-solvent interaction as hydrogen bonds and formation of stable clusters, and also the number and configuration of explicit water molecules. In fact, even for tetibutyl chloride, which is known that react by an SN1 mechanism, an SN2-like was, uh, uh, was identified depends on the water molecules configuration. And studies about solvolysis reaction of secondary substrate point out that this process passed by merged mechanism with characteristics of SN1 and SN2. So according to this consideration, our main goal is to understand the reaction mechanism of isopropyl chloride which is a secondary substrate. So understand the reaction mechanism of solvolysis of the secondary substrate in atomic level. To do so, we want to, to simulate water explicit solvent configuration using two models, by Monte Carlo calculation and microsolvation. And we want to investigate the influence of this initial configuration into the reaction profile and also explore how the number of water explicit molecules influence the reaction mechanism type in special SN1 and SN2 mechanism. Our all DFT calculations were made at M062x level associated with this Dunning base set 
And this combination was previously selected by undergraduate Barbara Peixoto in a benchmark study. To simulate the explicit solvent, we use Monte Carlo calculation to know the number of water molecules in the first solvation shell and also to obtain a better, a, a better initial gas to evaluate the solvolysis reaction. We also use explicit microsolvation in which we organize the water molecules around the substrate to promote a solvation of nucleophile and living group. All Monte Carlo calculations were made at DICE, and we selected the highest GR of first, second, and third radio distribution function, or DF. We is explored two solvation models. The first one, pure explicit solvation, which I call pure solvation model, and also the mixing with, combi with use explicit plus implicit solvation. I will start my results talking about the Monte Carlo configuration. And this are the optimized geometry obtained from the first RDF, which is calculated from mass center of the substrate. The second RDF calculated from all atoms of the isopropyl chloride. And then the third RDF, which is calculated from the electrophilic center, which is the electrophilic carbon, also the reaction site of the solvolysis. As the third RDF is our reaction site, we selected the highest GR and also the complete first insolvation shell to compare with the other configurations. Okay, looking to our enthalpy diagram, we can see initially that the energy barriers calculated with 9, 12, and 23 water molecules present similar results, about 20 kK per mole. So this shows us that the simulation of 9 water molecules is enough to describe the solvolysis reaction in atomic lab. To understand the, 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 the energy barriers, we look into the transition state structure. And we see that as the number of water molecules interacting with the chloride increase, the energy barriers decrease. In fact, for simulation of five water molecules, chloride interacting with only one water molecule, and this is the highest energy barrier. And in the first solvation shell, the chloride interacted with four water molecules, and this is the small energy barrier. I also want to highlight that besides in first solvation shell, we have 23 water molecules. There is no difference in the water interacting with the chloride. So this is probably the reason why there is no change in the energy barrier with 12 and 23 water molecules. To confirm, to con actually, the TLPG atomic charge agreed with our result, our hypothesis about living group stabilization. As the number of water molecules increase, the, the atomic charge in chloride at transition state reduces. And now, to confirm this hypothesis about living group stabilization, we explore the reaction mechanism by means of the activation stream model. This is a fragmentation approach to understand the reaction profile looking to the initial configuration. As Professor Trevor Holling talked yesterday, the electronic energy in all, in all intrinsic reaction coordinate is decomposed into two contributions. The first one is the interaction energy which is uh, stabilization energy from the interaction between the fragments. And the second is the strain energy, calculated due to the deformation of the fragments along all reaction coordinate. We selected all water molecule cluster as one fragment and the substrate as other fragment. And this is the activation strain diagram, which we located the electronic energy and the strain and interaction energy. Initially, we need to select, select a consistent geometry to understand the, the, the other points. 
Okay, so first thing, looking to the early TS, which is with 5 and 12 water molecules here in blue and, and red, we can see that the strain curves almost overlap. So there is no difference between the deformation of water cluster and substrate using 5 and 12 explicit water molecules. But there is a huge difference on the interaction energy between 12 and 5 water molecules. So this shows us that the difference between the energy very calculated for 5 and 12 is due to the interaction trends. And it's agreed with our hypothesis about living group stabilization. Now looking to the late TS with nine water molecules here in green, we can see that along all reaction coordinate, the strain role is the smallest. So in with nine water molecules, there is a smaller destabilization from the deformation of the fragment. So with nine water molecules, this is the trend of the, the reaction. From the microsolvation configuration, we obtained this initial structure in which the water molecules were organizing to promote the solvation of nucleophile living group and also looking to a uh, stable interaction as hydrogen bonds. So we simulated three, five, and seven water molecules and three, one water is the nucleophile to the solvent five water molecules, one is the nucleophile, and four is solvent, and in seven water molecules, one nucleophile and two is solvent. This is the enthalpy diagram that we calculated. I also put here the complete first solvation shell to compare the energy barriers. Okay, initially we can see that only with five water molecules, the energy barriers calculated were very similar using pure and mixed solvation model, about one more time, 20 kK per mole. With seven water molecules, the energy very calculated only approximated to the first solvation shell when, when we use the mixed solvation model. So we need the continuum model to obtain energy berries closest to the first solvation shell. For this configuration, we don't find a relationship between chloride stabilization and the energy barrier as using seven water molecules, the chloride interact with only with three water molecules and it still has high energy barrier. So looking also looking to the atomic charge of the chloride, we can see that in the pure solvation model, there is no difference between the atomic charge using five and seven water molecules. So one more time, there is no relationship with living group stabilization. So to understand this profile, we use one more time the fragmentation probe by means of the activation strain model, and which we explore the interaction and strain energy along the all reaction coordinate. One more time, we select the substrate as one fragment and the water molecule cluster as other fragment. And we're looking to the activation strain diagram. One more time, we need to select a point as a consistent geometry to compare the other, the other points. First, from the early TS, which he is blue and green curve with from five and seven water molecules, we can see that along all reaction coordinate, the interaction energy is the same. So the interaction between the substrate and water molecule cluster using five or seven water molecules, there is no difference. As we already said with about the, for an example, the atomic charge. But looking to the strain curves, we can see that there is a difference in the strain. So with five, with seven water molecules, the strain here is in blue, is more destabilization. So when we use in seven water molecules, there is a highest deformation of water molecule cluster 
and compare it to the five water molecules. We associated this to the fact that for a microsolvation configuration, we impose the geometry and this probably increased the water cluster distortion. Now looking to the late TS with three water molecules, we can see that there is a smaller interaction and interaction is the stabilization factor. So we conclude that the simulation that using three water molecules uh, will have few water to look to um, identify effective interaction between the fragments. So we need to simulate more water molecules. Okay. Now, finally, looking to the reaction mechanism type, we use the moral fair Jenks plot in which we can understand the reaction mechanism from the TS nature. Starting with an SN2 reaction mechanism, in this process, the bond between carbon and living group is broken at the same time that the bond carbon nucleophile is formed. So this is a concerted process in which, one more time, the broken of carbon, the, the, the bond carbon living group is broken at the same time that the bond carbon nucleophile is formed. So an SN2 reaction mechanism in a more ferrogen plot will be like that, which is a concerted process, also known as associative dissociative process. While in an SN1 reaction mechanism, the first step is the the dissociation of the bond carbon living group forming a carbocation and only then there is the attack of nucleophile in the carbon so in the moral ferrogen plot this is an sn1 like mechanism in the first step in the first step the bond carbon living group is dissociated and only then there is the association of the bond carbon nucleophile. This process is also known dissociativity plus associativity. This is our results of the transition stage of all configuration. And we first want to highlight that our intrinsic reaction coordinate ERC calculation show us that the bond formation of carbon nucleophile so all process independent independent of the configuration solvation model and also the number of water molecule is an associative dissociative process an SN2. But when we're looking for the moral ferrogenics plot here by microsolvation here from Monte Carlo calculations, we see that all TS or dissoci has dissociative character, also known as Lucy TS. This is very similar to a process dissociativity plus associativity and as in one reaction mechanism. So according to these results, we conclude that all reaction mechanism of the isopropyl chloride, which is a secondary superstate, pass by an SN2 mechanism with loose TS, which is a dissociative character, or by a merged one as has characteristics of SN2 and SN1 reaction mechanism. And also there are no sig significant difference between the energy barriers calculating using pure and mixed solvation model for the most configuration. As I show, the only difference is for seven water molecules using micro solvation configuration. And the activation strain analysis shows that the interaction energy, in special the interaction between chloride and living group, rules the energy barriers calculated for the most Monte Carlo configuration, while the strain rules the microsolvation configuration, in which we associate it to the imposed geometry, which increase the water deformation. And finally, that the simulation of nine water molecules is enough to describe and solve the reaction. And I want to, to highlight that this configuration were obtained from Monte Carlo calculation using the third or DF, which is also the which is calculated from the reaction site, the electrophilic carbon. We have as future expectation understand the interaction trends of this reaction by means of the energy decomposition analysis. 
by EDA calculation to understand the electro electrostatic and polar repulsion and orbital interaction, and also reproduce this evaluation for the other allies, fluoride, bromide, and iodine. So this is what I selected to show you today. Thank you all for your attention. Very good, Karin. Nice to hear Thank from you. 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 Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but let people in the audience also do some questions. Okay. Uh, first, I would ask you, this, this, this is one point that was discussed yesterday. It is about the selection of the points on the reaction coordinate to take the, the values for the, uh, for the uh, discussion of the strain and interaction energy. How do you select the points? You can repeat, please. I this is the question that I'm I'm saying. Yeah. No. The, the, this uh, is a question that I have gone to you now, not this one that is in the in the in the. So I, I'm asking you because you 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 show some points on the on the reaction coordinate where you select to to do the analysis of the interaction and the strain energy. Yeah. Yeah. The, the question is, where, how do you select these points? Or, or it was not so? Okay, let me think that I that I understand your question. We're looking first to the all reaction coordinate as yeah. The, yeah. the 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 sorry, I am really in the wrong. You can show me the question. I, I think that I can. No, I, I, I did not write it. What? Okay, let, let's go to another point. Uh, the, the, the water molecules have a, a, a tendency to, to self, self interact. It means interaction yeah. among the, the several other molecules. Uh, how do you avoid this? And how, how do you uh, make it to prefer interaction with the substrate? Okay, okay. So in when we use the Monte Carlo configuration, this interaction solvent solvent is very strong as we look into the complete first solvation shell. And we this is actually that's not a huge influence on the strain energy. I don't know if, if this is what you're asking. When we use Monte Carlo calculation, but when we use micro solvation, this is uh, uh this he has a influence the mm -hmm. the interaction that i see in monte carlo calculation promotes the solvolysis reaction but when we organize the water molecules around the substrate this is a problem in the strain only this and not when we use monte carlo calculations okay there is a, a question from from patrick I don't know, Patrick, or the Luciano. Luciano, what software you use to do the Monte Carlo calculation? Dice. dice. I use Dice. Huh? Yeah. Is there, is there a particular... Uh, did you get to use the PyFrag tool? Yeah. Yeah. All the activation strain analysis, I use the PyFrag. Yeah. And in Gaussian, associated with the Gaussian. The last uh, version of PyFrag can use it in the, the Orca, Gaussian, and also the Turbo Mod be, be, besides the EDF. So I use the PyFrag. Okay. One last, one last question. I did. I am not seeing new new one here. Okay. One last question. Uh, it seems that the solvation of the anion is more relevant than the solvation of the cation. Yeah, the living group solvation of the living group is more relevant than solvation of the carbocation that is forming. Is it true? And 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 it's if it's true, why? Okay, to know, in fact, we need the the calculation in which we will explore the interaction of chloride and water molecules, and also the carbon and water molecules. This the results that we have now show us that the interaction of of water water with living group is more relevant than water and carbon 
but to know in short we need the, the calculations okay thank you Karin once more it was a very nice presentation thank you thank, thank you, you we're now moving to the second presentation of this afternoon. It is the presentation of Diane Luizzi D'Amato. Diane is graduated at UF in chemistry and is now working at the Supramolecular Chemistry and Nanotechnology Laboratory, coordinated by Professor Celia Ronconi. Her interest is in the development of techniques to fast detection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, a subject of, of, of course, that is of high interest in the present days. Uh, she will talk about, and I lost, but I can look here, gold nanoparticle immunoassay for the fast detection of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein by dynamic light scattering. scattering. Please, Diane, the word is with you. Hi, everybody. After presentation. I just need to know if you're all listening to me right now. Is everybody listening to me right now? I can see. Yeah, yes, we are hearing. OK, so I'm going to start. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diane. And today I'm going to be presenting our work that we are developing here at Fluminense Federal University entitled Gold Nanoparticles Immunoassay for the Fast Detection of SARS-CoV-2 Spike Protein by Dynamic Light Scattering. So here in Brazil, since the beginning of the pandemic, we had over 22 million cases causing at least 612,000 deaths. And if we look at this number of new cases every day around the world, and despite decreasing, it is still a significant number of new cases every day. And today, two years after the first confirmed cases, after all the scientific efforts towards this disease, we have a lot of different vaccines and diagnostics tests that were developed. And the ability to fast track, identify and isolate these new cases is still very important to slow the spread of this virus. And today we have uh, three major groups of diagnostic tests. We have the molecular tests, rapid serological tests, and rapid antigen tests. The molecular tests, as we know, one example is the PCR. It identifies specific regions of the viral RNA. But this kind of test requires a lot of time and trained personnel. So uh, the rapid serological test and antigen test can be an alternative. Uh, the serological tests, for example, they detect the antibodies, IgG and IG IgM, on the patient. So this is not a good option for the early diagnosis. This only happens after you have an Im immune response for, from the patient. So this can take uh, up to two weeks after the first exposure to the disease. Um, an alternative to it, that is use the rapid antigen tests. They are fast, low cost, and easy to analyze. And one can develop this by uh, exploring the antibody-antigen interactions that are very uh, and highly specific. And one can do that by using nanobio sensors, in special here using functionalized gold nanoparticles uh, to explore the gold nanoparticles properties, physical and chemical properties, such as their high light scattering efficiency. So the idea here is if we have the antigen in the sample, this can interact with the antibody attached to the gold nanoparticle surface and this provokes and gold nanoparticle aggregations and this aggregation can be easily detected by the increase of the hydrodynamic diameter that can be detected by the dy dynamic light scattering technique that can identify the size of the part particles in solution so our idea or our goal of this work is to use a nanobio sensor with this 
antibodies attached to the gold nanoparticles as a rapid antigen test that, that can detect even a small amount of virus in the patient system. And this would, uh, the presence of this virus would uh, cause a significant change in the DLS measurements. And here, to, in order to do that, those uh, spike proteins that are on the sarcop surface were used to inoculate horses to produce an hyperimmune serum with uh, full of antibodies, anti-spike. And this antibody was were used to produce these nanobiosensors. And it's important me, for me to say that here in this work, we only studied the interactions of our system with the actual protein, not the, the virus itself. So the first step of this work was to synthesize the gold nanoparticles. And we used the seeded growth method there with modifications from literature. And we obtain different size of gold nanoparticles ranging from 40 to 130 nanometers. And the first step of this synthesis is to produce these little seeds with sodium citrate and this gold salt. And with these uh, little seeds produced, the following steps are cycles that we add more gold and more sodium citrate. So for each cycle, we obtain uh, larger particles from this gold that we are adding to be, uh, to be attached to the surface so it can enlarge the size of each particle. So these gold nanoparticles were characterized by UV spectroscopy, and we can see a color change from red to purple and the change in the plasmonic resonance band. And here the DLS measurements uh, showed that great stability for these gold nanoparticles and the, their increase on size for each size cycle of the synthesis. So the other characterization that we we did was to make a transmission electron microscopy. And we can see here that all the different sizes were in the spherical shape. And these measurements were proceeded so we could calculate the size for each of the cycles that we did. So for the synthesis of the nanobiosensors, we have here uh, that hyperimmune serum with uh, the antibodies. And in order to attach them to the gold nanoparticle surface, the first step of the synthesis is use a crosslinker that is responsible to interact uh, with the gold nanoparticle surface and to interact further on with the IgG antibody solution. So the crosslinker is responsible to attach the antibody into the gold nanoparticle surface. And the third step of the synthesis is to add the BSA, that is a protein that will be filling up all the empty spots that the IgG left and to help to stabilize the gold nanoparticles solution. And here we have the DLS measurements confirming this attachment of the antibody into the gold nanoparticles uh, for all the different sizes that we studied, the 40 size, 60, 80, 100, and 130. And we see all the different measurements from the gold nanoparticles itself, the gold nanoparticle with the crosslinker and the gold nanoparticles with the antibody in them. And we can see a increase in the size confirming this attachment. So here we have the study that we did on changing the amount of uh, antibodies that we added to the synthesis. So it's important to study this part because the amount of EDG is the amount of active sites that can be interacting with the protein, the S-protein, further on 
on the immunoassay tests. So here we can see that uh, the antibody itself can uh, be attached in different ways. So this also can decrease or increase the active sites they are able to interact with the, the S protein further on. So here are the immunoassay that we actually did it with the, again, with the protein, the S protein that is on the SARS-CoV-2 surface. Uh, so first we have the, we measure the sample itself, the, the system without any addition of protein, just on the buffer and the blank. And then we added the protein. We wait for 10 minutes, for 30 minutes, so they can interact with each other. And if we see a change in the hydrodynamic diameter, this indicated this interaction between the protein and the AGG. This is also showed by the DLS measurements. So the third part here is the what we obtained after this experiment. And we can see here that for the 40 nanometer size, we didn't see any change uh, upon the addition of the spike protein. So these size were no longer used in any other in further tests. And for the, all the other sizes ranging from 60 to 130 nanometers, we obtained uh, an interaction between our system and the spike protein. And we can see here that with the bigger uh, gold nanoparticles, we obtained uh, bigger changes in the hydrodynamic diameters, indicating uh, that the systems with 130 nanometers are more uh, sensible to this to these tests. So the same, uh, the same, the same uh, immunoassay here was repeated, but changing the protein spike concentration. So we could determine it, the detection limit for each of the systems. And all of them presented what we call the hook effect. That what happens is when we increase the antigen concentration, this also increases the hydrodynamic diameters until we reach a maximum point uh, where all the binding sites are occupied. So it's like we form a monolayer over the gold nanoparticles, and this uh, prevents further aggregation. So this, uh, after the formation of monolayer, what happens is that uh, all the, the hydrodynamic diameters decrease after uh, and concentration, high concentration of the antigen. So here we have just the curve for the 130 nanometers. And this first step of the curve was used to obtain this calibration curve. So we could be uh, identifying um, unknown, uh, the quantity of a protein S in an unknown a uh, sample. And the third step, uh, another thing that we studied was the time influence of this immunoassay. So we did it the same thing, but changing the 30 minute period, we stood it for over an hour. And here is important to note that with the different sizes, 130 and 100 nanometers, all we see in all the time periods, we see a significant change in the hydrodynamic diameters, even with time as small as five minutes. So in indicating that this system could be used as a, a rapid antigen test. So in conclusion of this work, our bio nanosensors with four, five different sizes were synthesized and but only four of them were active in the immunoassay with the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And we also studied different test conditions and we obtained that 
with bigger the go nanoparticles that we use it resulted in better responses in the immunoassay with the spike protein and now for the perspective of this work is to actually study patient samples with uh, inactivated uh, virus particles. So if so, we can see if our systems work with the virus as well as is working for the protein S. So first, I'd like to acknowledge all the other students that are working in this project, Tamiri Soares, Acolorino Ligeiro, Francisco Gaspar. And I'd like also thank you, all the different collaborators and the mute users uh, laboratories and Luciano for the chance of be presenting our work here today and all of you for the attention. Thank you, Diane, for the presentation. This is a very interesting project. You could advance very fast and have a lot of results in a very small time. Huh? Yeah. We have some questions here, one from Michael, you can see. In the, can I the, yeah? change my... I'm going to slow my screen so I can see all of you. Yeah. Are you seeing? Uh, yes. Yeah. Are the gold nanoparticles with the cross-link reusable after each test, or are they only can be used what you how you would the samples be collected for the test same as pcr no we are actually trying to study this for uh on the mouth with the i don't know how to say this but without having all the trouble as the pcr and no the system can only be used once but the amount that we use it for in sample is like 10 microliters of the nanobio sensor that we are using. Okay, there is another question from Professor Luciano. Uh, oh, I, I can see here now. Uh, could you comment on the stability? Yes, we did a study over a two month period and our biosensor was stable and as far as we tested from today. So like at minimum, we have a two month period of uh, stability. And talked about the challenge you had working on. Uh, at first we had a little trouble to work on this stability of the of our biosensor. But now we, with our synthesis, this can is working with all the different sizes, even with the smallest to the bigger size, they are all being stable now. Okay, thank you. Is it there any question? Any additional question? From our audience? Okay. So I will, we are, uh, we, uh, Thank you, Diane, for your presentation. As I, said, I told before, very, very interesting project with very, very relevant results. Thank you uh, uh, again. We move now for to the third presentation. Let me see here. This is from Isabella. Isabella Alves de Albuquerque Bessa. Isabella graduated uh, in chemistry from the Universidade Federal Fluminense. He, she is also working in the Laboratory of Supramolecular Chemistry and Nanotechnology under the supervision of Professor Celia Ronconi. Uh, her interest is in the functionalization of graphene oxide with polymers and microcycles for the treatment of leishmaniasis. She is now working in the development of mesoporosilica and hydroxyapatite nanocomposites for the treatment of cancer. The talk from today is mesoporosilica hydroapatite nanocomposites, a biocompatible material for cancer treatment. Please, Isabella, the screen is with you.
We are not hearing you, please. Your microphone is is not not with the sound. What about okay. now? Okay. Yes, 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 okay. Okay, sorry. Just a second. Okay, let's go. Hi, everyone. Again, uh, good afternoon. My name is Isabella. I'm a master's student at Fluminense Federal University, and I'm going to present to you my work, Mesopause Silica Hydroxapatite, a non composite, a biocompatible material for cancer treatment. So, um, cancer is a generic term for a large group of disease that can affect any part of the body. One defined feature of cancer is the rapid creation of abnormal cells that grow beyond their usual boundaries and which can then invade in joint parts of the body and spread to other organs, as called metastasis. Uh, cancer is a leading cause of death worldwide, accounting uh, 10, 10 million deaths in 2020. The most common common cancer type in 2020 were breast, lung, colon, rectum, prostate, skin, and stomach. In Brazil, we have about 92 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. Between 30% and 50% of the cancer can currently be prevented by avoiding risk factors. Also, a correct cancer diagnosis is essential for appropriate and an effective treatment because every cancer type requires a specific treatment regimen. Uh, treatment usually includes radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and or surgery. The chemotherapy treatment includes intravenous formulation of several drugs, such as cisplatin, doxorubicin, and methotrexate. Since these molecules have weak interaction with the targets, they also attack health cells, resulting in the failure of conventional chemotherapy. So in this scenario, nanoparticles have been developed to target therapies to specific tissues. Modulation of physical chemical properties, such as size and charge, could improve nanoparticle targeting to specific tissues. This technology, named as drug delivery system, holds the potential to address the lim this limitation and have emerging parallel to drug discovery process. Over the years, uh, drug delivery research has offered multiple approaches to target drugs, including local therapies such as topical formulations and physical devices. Uh, uh, local therapies offer the simplest means uh, of targeting. However, they are not practical when the disease sites are hard to reach. Uh, so we call a smart drug delivery a nanocarrier capable of achieve the target site and respond to some kind of stimulus. Normally, the stimulation is a trigger in order to release the cargo specifically at the, the target site. Uh, here we have some examples. The most common uh, between them is pH, since there is a significant difference between our blood pH and in our cancer cell environment pH. In our research group, we have already contributed with some drug deliveries, such as magnetic nanoparticles for cancer treatment. Uh, we also have reduced graphene oxide to leishmaniasis treatment uh, as a phototherapy agent. Uh, here, I would like to highlight the use of mesoporal silica nanoparticle in, in our group. First, this work we have here, we have two systems based on grafting the surface of mesoporal silica nanoparticle with host gas pair of ferrocenyl group and cyclodextrin attached to gold nanoparticles. Uh, the investigation of doxorubicin release from the nanovolve uh, triggered by oxidation of the ferrocene group in weakly, weakly acid in, uh, medium showed that doxorubicin release depends on the concentration of molecular oxygen and pH. These systems were used to deliver doxorubicin to mouse meloma cancer cells, and the cell viability results shown that doxorubicin loaded nanovols were more toxic to the cells than both free doxorubicin and the empty nanocarriers, suggesting that the nanocarriers have improved the internalization of doxorubicin into more cells. 
In a more recent work, we described the assembled and pH-driven uh, operation of two nanocarriers based on non-functionalized and, and carboxylate functionalized containers, both loaded with doxorubicin and ammonium pilarine as a nanogate. Uh, some in vitro, in vitro studies show that carbox carboxylating functionalized loaded and caped material could penetrate and release the doxorubicin in the, into the nucleus of human breast and uh, cell, cancer cells, leading to pronunciated cytotox effect. Uh, in, li in, li in literature, there are some studies showing that the morphology could influence in the cell diffusion. So inspired by the micro bio inhibitant road shape morphologies have shown uh, have been explored in this area since we had a great result in the last paper as shown before we are now working in two different non-evolves uh, with with different morphologies this work is uh, aline is working on that but until now what is silico mesoporous silicon nanoparticles so, mesoparticle silicon nanoparticles are solid materials consisting of hundreds of empty channels, which assemble based on two-dimensional or three-dimensional porous structure. The highly ordered porous network of mesoporous silicon nanoparticles allows a high loading capacity of hydrophilic or hydrophobic cargos and provide a drug controlled release. These nanoparticles, as well as another inorganic nanoparticle, displays distinct, distinctive properties, including corrosion resistance and high chemical, mechanic, mechanical, and thermal stability. Uh, moreover, uh, mesoporous silicon nanoparticle represents modifiable characteristics like tunable pores diameter in the range of two and 15 nanometers, a large pore volume, and a high surface area. As a drug delivery system, several works, including ours, have been modifying its surface in order to achieve a better surface charge, more negative or more positive, uh, which improves the dispersion of the material in the physiological environment. The functionalization can also work as an anchor point to microcycles, such as cyclodestrin, cocobiturils, and pilarines, to function as a gate, as gatekeepers, and avoid cargo release. So in this case here, uh, pH is the most used stimulus to open and close this gate. This type of material is called nanogate carriers or nanovalve, as I said before. Uh, mesoporous silicon nanoparticle can also form a core shell structure. Since its surface area is high, the loss of area due to the presence of the core does not make any significant difference. And it's justified by the addition of some characteristic of the core. In this example here, uh, due to the presence of the magnetic nanoparticle core, the nanocomposite presents magnetic properties and maintains silica properties too. Uh, as you can see, there is an amount, uh, enormous amount of paper using silica as nanocarriers. But even so, there are some controversy about the biodegradability of this material. For this reason, we uh, some biomaterials such as minerals have been incorporated in the silica structure to improve its biocompatibility. Uh, hydroxapatite is an inorganic material that forms bone tissue. Hydroxapatite is characterized by calcium phosphor ratio of 1.67 and presents stability in high pH values. Therefore, at cancer cell environment, hydroxapatite undergoes hydrolysis and forming the calcium phosphate. So, the main goal of this work is to synthesize a core shell structure form a, formed by a core of hydroxapatite and a shell of mesoporous silicon nanoparticle, followed by characterization with several techniques. Later, the nanocomposite will be used as a, non, as a gated nanocarrier for smart controlled release of doxorubicin or methotrexate. So the methodology used in this work was described by a 2015 paper. In the presence of CTAB, a cationic surfactant and phosphate, tetrachyl orthosilicate and calcium chloride were added to the dispersion and maintained for four hours. Then this mixture was filtered, washed with methanol and water. And finally, the solid was calcinated to remove the CTAB 
which works as the template of the pores of mesopore silica. Uh, so starting with thermogravimetric thermogravimetric analysis, we can observe that the material before calcination, the black curve, has a 10% weight loss around 200 degrees due to the surfactant inside the pores. And after calcination is the red curve, we can see the material uh, maintain its weight in it, so it's very stable. The Fourier trans transforming infrared spectroscopy showed so the hydroxy stretching band from both phases uh, as silica and hydroxapatite. We can see also the phosphate stretching band from hydroxapatite phase. And we also see the stretching band from silicon oxygen silicon group. Uh, the powder X-ray diffraction showed good correspondence of hydroxapatite phase with an anamorgian region around uh, 20 degrees due to amorphous silica phase. And we, here we can also observe a peak in 1.81 degrees referred to the pores of mesopore silica phase. The isotherm of mesoporic silicon nanoparticle provides a BAT surface area equal to 893 meters square per gram, which is a little lower than reporting literature as a consequence of the method chosen to remove the pores template and as the black curve is forgot to set. And the isotherm of nanocomposite provides a BAT surface area equal to 300, 378 meters square per gram due to the presence of hydroxapatite, which does not present a mesopore structure. Uh, both materials present a pore diameter around 2.70 nanometers. So for a, for a biological application, this material must be stable in the aqueous environment. So the dynamic light scattering provides a hydro, hydro, hydrodynamic demeter of 189 nanometers with a polydisperse index of 0 0.158. And the surface charger is measured by zeta potential, with, which was minus 14.5 millivolts. The scanning lateral microscopy showed a uh, spherical morphology and with some aggregates. And the transmission electron microscopy showed both phases of mesopore silicon and hydroxapatite. However, they seem to be segregated, in which the hydroxapatite phase appears to be forming a, a film on top of the silicon nanoparticle. Uh, here, in the bottom, we can see this image. We only see nanoparticles of silica, and we can see its pores. So in conclusion, we need to study more this material and try to understand what's really happening with them, and if there are some interface between them. We are also, we are also searching for new methodologies to incorporate hydroxapatite inside the mesoporous silicas to further build the gated non gated keeping nanocarrier. So I would like to thank my advice, Celia, my friends from Supermolecular Chem Chemistry and Nanotechnology Laboratory, in special Aline, Tamiris, Carol, and Diane. I would like to thank the financial agents, the multi user multi laboratories, and the Brazilian Center of Physics Research. Thanks, Professor Luciano, for the invitation, and thank you for the attention. Okay, Isabella, thank you for your contribution. We have time for some questions. No? Isabella, do you know uh, the, the size of the poros in the in the in your material, your silica? It's around three nanometers. Is it possible to include, incorporate some, some uh, structure in these poros? What? Sorry. Uh, 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 you, you, the, the, because you said that the, the, the hydrox appetite, the, the next step is to include, try to include hydrox appetite in the, in the, uh, in the poros of the, of the, your material. Yes. Yes. How, how do, is it possible to incorporate this material in the poros? Or? After. Yes, we can, but we we are going to lose the, the area for the drug. 
So the pores will be loaded with the hydroxapatite, but then we cannot load it with the doxorubicin, for example. Yeah. There is a question from Luciano. You could read it. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a, a bit about all the possible applications of this material? Yes, uh, we can use it for any kind of drug, for leishmaniasis, tuberculosis, any, any kind of disease. But we are trying to use this material for treating uh, bone, ca bone cancer, for, for using this hydroxapatite as, as a regenerative uh, material. Okay. Any additional question? No? Okay, let's thank Isabella for your presentation. Thank you very much. We moved on to the last talk in this afternoon. This is a plenary lecture from Professor Andrew Paluk. Let me see here. It is an honor, Paluk, to have you here you, 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 for the second time. Professor Paluk has been here in the first workshop organized two years ago. In that opportunity, he, he could give you a short course and uh, uh, show two conferences, present two conferences. Thank you very much for your contribution, for your continuous contribution, Professor. Uh, Professor Paluk, uh, Andrew Paluk is graduated from the Sun University at Buffalo. Uh, and PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Notre Dame, where he was also a fellow and a research assistant. Professor Paluk joined the Miami University in 2013. His research interest is in molecular and phase equilibrium thermodynamics and separation process, employing molecular simulation in its broad sense, developing and applying molecular simulation techniques to a large spectrum of problems. In his laboratory at the Mayan University, he is developing molecular simulation methodologies for property prediction, design of novel materials, and solvents for separation process. Professor Paluk has published over 55 papers, which, uh, with uh, uh, over 700 citations. His talk today is about, let me see here where I have it. Predicting the distribution of drug-like solutes between octanol and water. This is a very interesting topic because octanol and water is the standard for, for measurement of, of the partition coefficient in, in polar and, and apolar system. Please, Professor Paluk, the word is with you. All right. Well, well thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, and it is an absolute uh, pleasure to, to be with you today. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, as you said, I, I was here in um, 2019. Um, so I, I guess my one of my last fond memories before the uh, world ended with the pandemic. Uh, and so during my time here during the first conference, I was able to teach a uh, workshop on the introduction um, on an introduction to performing solvation free energy calculations. Uh, and here's a picture of, of you know, our group um, at the end of the session. It was, it was a wonderful experience, wonderful opportunity. Um, and so I thank you, know, you for the opportunity to, to be able to um, interact and, and have so many great relationships with you all at, at UFI. Um, and so the, the topic of my talk today will be on uh, predicting octanol water partition coefficients uh, using molecular simulation. Uh, and so hopefully it's um, more of an informal talk, um, hopefully uh, instructional in nature to discuss some issues that we've been working on with predicting partition coefficients uh, and maybe to give you some food for thought if you're interested in predicting partition coefficients uh, in your own research. And so again, you know, thank you for inviting me again. This is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, hopefully in, in two more years, I can uh, attend in person in, in the third conference. Um, and I, I guess it should be 
the case. I visited Luciano first at UFI in June 2015. Uh, so then we have workshop here in November 2019. Right. So that means, uh, I believe in 2023, right? Uh, I should be back in, in UFI for, for another visit. All right. So the, the main part of the talk is going to center around um, a recent paper that I've published with an uh, undergraduate student in my group, Spencer Sabatino, um, on work related to the Sample 7 Challenge on predicting octanol water partition coefficients. And the main focus that we'll focus on in uh, this talk is on looking at the role of, you know, simulating NEAT versus water saturated octanol uh, and both the quantitative and qualitative effect um, of modeling octanol as either being NEAT or water saturated. All right. Well, we'll start, though, with a with a basic review of, of octanol water partition coefficients. Okay. All right. So I am a, uh, you know, theoretician uh, by nature, right? But I do remember um, some measuring of octanol water partition coefficients in my organic chemistry class um, while an undergraduate student. Right? And so uh, the basic picture I have in my mind is if I want to measure the octanol water partition coefficient of, of some solute, right? I would first put, you know, add my octanol, add my water um, to shake flask, add some small amount of my solute, shake it up, let my system equilibrate, you know, let that, you know, octanol rich and water rich phase separate. All right. And then uh, here I am with my separatory funnel. So once my um, organic phase, my octanol rich phase, which is up top here, uh, has separated from my water rich phase, I can remove. So I'll drain off the aqueous phase. And then I can measure the concentration of my solute in both that aqueous phase and that organic phase. And knowing the concentration of those two phases, I can back out my octanol water partition coefficient. So as Wachner said, right, octanol water partition coefficients are kind of this gold standard uh, in terms of partition coefficients and using them in terms of um, measuring the polar or nonpolar nature of a compound. Right, octanol in particular is of interest because we have this, you know, we have our polar head group with our long nonpolar chain. And so octanol is often thought of as, or is often used to mimic uh, intercellular materials. So if I was looking at partitioning between, um, you know, uh, aqueous system and uh, biological system of interest. So anyways, when I perform these shake flask experiments to measure my octanol water partition coefficient, okay, again, the idea is octanol and water are partially uh, immiscible. And so I end up getting a distinct organic phase in equilibrium with a, a liquid phase. And so when I add my solute to that system, okay, um, we like to keep our solute concentration low so that the solute can essentially be considered infinitely dilute. Okay. Reason for keeping our solute concentration low is to make sure that that solute's not affecting the equilibrium between our two solvents. Okay. And so experimentally, um, the mole frac or the mutual solubility of water and octanol and octanol and water is, so the, the solubility of water and octanol or the amount of water we would find in this octanol rich phase is 0 0.207 mole fracs. Um, while the concentration of octanol in this aqueous phase is 0.704 times 10 to the negative 4 mole fracs. Okay. And so essentially, the, the concentration of octanol in water, for all intents and purposes, is, is negligible. Okay, But this concentration here of, of water in my octanol rich phase is, is not negligible. Right? And so that's going to be the, the main topic of conversation here. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to use some cartoons to, to walk through the system. And so again, if I want to measure my partition coefficient, so if I perform the shake flask experiment and I drain off my aqueous phase, so I separate my aqueous phase from my organic phase and measure the concentration of my solute in those two phases, my octanol water partition coefficient right, is just related to the concentration of my solute in my octanol rich phase relative to my water rich phase, right? So here I'm just zooming out on that uh, cartoon of my octanol rich phase and my water rich phase. All right, so another benefit of measuring octanol water partition coefficient, right, is, is we can directly tie them. It's an experimental measurable that I can directly tie to intermolecular interactions. And so the idea being is experimentally, I measure the concentration in this octanol rich phase and this water rich phase. And so I can measure my 
octanol water partition coefficient is a log ratio of those two concentrations. And you can show then that my partition coefficient is equivalent to, this is just my transfer free energy and taking a solute from my water rich phase to my octanol rich phase, right? Essentially what this corresponds to is I have an equilibrium constant, right? So this is the delta G of equilibrium between my solute in these two phases in equilibrium. Okay, so it's the uh, essentially the transfer free energy of taking a solute from my water rich phase to my octanol rich phase. Okay, this term in front, this is just my conversion. So delta G of transfer, so my dimensionless delta G of transfer is equivalent to the natural log of my partition coefficient. So here I'm just changing base from uh, natural log to log base 10. Okay. So octanal water partition coefficients, so again, we can directly measure them. So concentration of my solute, my octanal rich phase relative to my water rich phase. And then my octanal water partition coefficient, right? I can relate to the intermolecular interactions in my system, right? Whereas log P is related to the transfer free energy of taking a solute from my water rich phase, which is essentially pure water to my octanal rich phase. Okay. And when we, you know, mentioned when we conduct these experiments, right, we typically keep the solute concentration low, right? So that the solute can be assumed infinitely dilute. Okay. Reason for that, again, is we make sure we minimize the effect of the solute on the equilibrium between those two solvents. But then additionally, when we think in terms of this transfer free energy, okay, when I look at my water rich phase, okay, by having a solute that's effectively infinitely dilute, I'm preventing any solute solute interactions from occurring in my solution. All right. So in this water rich phase, right, I have water interacting with water, of course, but then I have water interacting with solute, right? When I look at my octal rich phase, right, again, you have solvent interacting with solvent and solvent interacting with solute. And so when I compute my transfer free energy, right, what this is really giving me a measure of or what I'm really comparing is the interactions of my solute with water, or I guess since I'm writing it this way, the interactions of my solute with octanol relative to the interactions of my solute with water. Okay, so my transfer free energy is effectively a comparison of the, you know, favorability of those interactions of my solute with octanol relative to water. All right, so now in terms of thinking about log P, okay, so when my concentrations are the same, when the concentration of my solute in octanol is equivalent to the concentration of my solute in water, okay, this ratio here becomes one, the log of one is, is zero, okay. So if I had a log P of, of zero, right, that would tell us that the, you know, solute is indifferent, you know, relative, you know, whether it's in octanol or water, right, has no preference for that octanol rich phase or, or my water rich phase. Okay. But when I have a log P greater than zero, okay, what that means is the concentration of my solute in that octanol rich phase is greater than the concentration of my solute in my water rich phase. Okay, and so that means we have a preference or my solute has a preference for my octanol rich phase relative to water. On the other hand, if log P is less than zero, that then tells me that the concentration of my solute in my water rich phase is greater than the concentration of my solute in my octanol rich phase. So my solute has a preference for water, right, over that octanol rich phase. Okay, so log P is greater than zero is an affinity for octanol. Log P less than zero is affinity for water. Okay, we can relate log P to my transfer free energy, right, which gives us essentially a direct comparison of the interactions between our solute with our solvent, right, in that octanol rich phase uh, and our water rich phase. So comparing solute octanol relative to solute water interactions. All right. So performing experiments with a shake flask is fine, right? And so that's you know the picture you know I have in my head when I think about octanol water partition coefficients. Okay? But the challenge is is the performing shake flask experiments can be extremely time consuming, expensive, uh, and could be you know um, subject to uh, you know relatively higher level of, of inaccuracy, right? And we'll kind of touch on those points um, momentarily. Okay? And so. Um, in the work of, of C and Sandler, right? So it, it's instead of performing, you know, these shake flask experiments, so C and Sandler were interested in developing some method, some simple method um, for efficiently predicting log P's for large databases of compounds. So they were interested in looking at or predicting log P um, of organic pollutants. 
Okay. And so they said, okay, we need to develop or we want to develop an alternative to the shake flask. Okay. And I'll, um, in case I didn't mention, C and Sandler are experimentalists, right? So we're still thinking from an experimental point of view here. And so what they did is, is okay, right? What I want is this octanal water partition coefficient, right? Which is equivalent to this transfer free energy um, between my solute uh, and water or an octanal relative to water. And so what they instead thought of is let's construct a thermodynamic cycle where instead of you know going directly from octanol or water to octanol, I'm going to construct a path in which I have a reference state in which I have my compound of interest in this pure liquid state. Okay. And then I'm going to look at the transfer between my solute in that pure liquid state to octanol and my pure liquid state relative to water. Okay. The idea being, right, in constructing this thermodynamic path, that if what I want is delta G of transfer, right, that's equivalent to the transfer free energy and in going from my pure liquid to octanol minus the transfer free energy and in going from my pure liquid to my water rich phase. Okay. And so the idea here is rather than having this shake flask experiment in which, you know, they're, they're time consuming, right? I, I have, a, you know, a shake flask containing water and octanol. I add some solute to it, shake it up, and then I need to sit and wait for that system to equilibrate, okay? And, you know, these are complicated systems, right? And so that equilibration time uh, is non-trivial. And so the idea here is by constructing this, you know, thermodynamic path or, or decomposing it is I can have, you know, uh, you know, independent independent measurements, right? So can I measure the transfer free energy of going from pure liquid to octanol, all right? And then can I likewise, you know, measure this transfer free energy and going from pure liquid to water, right? So perform independent experiments involving my octanol rich phase and my water rich phase, okay? And, you know, essentially how they did that is, you know, I write it here as a transfer free energy and going from pure liquid to octanol and pure liquid to water, Okay, but what that's directly related to is a limiting activity coefficient, right? So my limiting activity coefficient of component one, in my octanol rich phase is equivalent to this dimensionless transfer free energy plus a log ratio of volumes, okay? And so the idea is, is I could perform an experiment using only my pure octanol rich phase, an independent experiment using my, you know, pure, you know, water phase, I can perform a chromatographic experiment in both of those independent cases to measure my limiting activity coefficient. Okay. Once I have my limiting activity coefficient, right, I can relate that to the transfer free energy in going from pure liquid to octanol um, in both cases and, and pure liquid to water. And once I have that transfer free energy for these two uh, independent processes, I could use that to calculate delta G of transfer. Okay. So the idea being is rather than perform the shake flask, right, where the main, you know, issue there is the time required to equilibrate, you know, that um, ternary system, right? And so mainly that time to equilibrate and allow octanol and water to, to sufficiently equilibrate and separate. Can I instead perform independent simulations just involving water and just performing octanol to measure the equivalence of a transfer free energy from a pure liquid to my phase of interest? And then once I have the transfer free energy from my pure liquid to octanol and my pure liquid to water, all right, I could take the difference in those two and that would be equivalent to the transfer free energy of interest. But that wasn't all, all right? So, okay, this is great, right, in terms of decomposing the system, okay? But the issue is, is C and Sandler still didn't like having to perform calculations with water-saturated octanol, right? It's just, yeah, so in terms of, you know, creating that, you know, you know, isolated system of water saturated with octanol. Well, right, I would still end up having to perform some, you know, LLE system or LLE um, a shake flask involving just pure water and pure octanol, separate my octanol rich phase and my water rich phase, and then perform the calculations on those independently. So they said, what would be even better is if instead of using water saturated octanol, what if we could just look at pure octanol, okay? And so what they proposed is they essentially um, assumed, right, that they could perform an experiment using pure octanol, right, and so compute my limiting activity coefficient, which is related to the transfer free energy of going from pure liquid uh, to pure octanol. And effectively what they've assumed is that um, 
uh, how am I trying to say this? That uh, the transfer free energy from pure liquid to w water saturated octanol is nothing more than a linear combination of the transfer free energy of my from pure liquid to pure octanol and pure um, liquid to pure water, right? And so how they phrased that or how they uh, expressed it is essentially they assumed that my, you know, transfer free energy of interest, right? And going from water to water saturated octanol is linearly correlated with my transfer free energy from water to pure octanol, okay? So effectively they're assuming that the transfer free energy from pure liquid to pure or to water saturated octanol could be approximated as a linear combination of the transfer free energy from pure liquid to pure octanol and pure liquid to pure water, which they write here is saying the transfer free energy from water to water saturated octanol is linearly correlated with the transfer free energy from water to pure octanol. And now the benefit of this would be now you really can have this setup in which I have a system of pure octanol, right? I can readily measure the limiting activity coefficient of my solute in pure octanol. I can readily measure the limiting activity coefficient of my solute with pure water. And then if I have essentially this calibration curve, um, if, I, if I've trained this calibration curve, I can then use those measurements to predict my transfer free energy for my system of interest. Okay, so is the idea. Um, and so they did this, right? And so again, you know, the beauty of this is they give them uh, a method, an indirect method to um, predicting log P or calculating log P, right? And they were really trying to avoid having to look at water saturated octanol, right? Performing these shake flask experiments uh, is not trivial, right? So the equilibration time is, is really long, right? And, you know, one statistic to really emphasize how challenging those experiments can be is that mutual solubilities in the literature, so looking at solubility of water and octanol, the acceptable range, right? There isn't necessarily a you know, true acceptable value, but typically there's a range that spans from 0.2 mole frax to 0.29 mole frax, right? So presumably, right, the, the issue is, is you know, people aren't allowing their um, systems you know, sufficient time to equilibrate before making uh, measurements. So C and Sandler applied this method. Um, so they looked at 12 organic pollutants, right? And so by uh, organic pollutants, so this should be alkanes. So they looked at uh, 12 um, organic pollutants, which were really alkanes and chloroalkanes. Experimental log P's range from 1.25 to 4.99. And so what they found is, is that their method worked uh, pretty well. The average absolute error was about 0.2 log units. Um, which uh, wasn't too far off from the air in the direct shake flask experiments. Okay. Um, and interestingly, for, for their systems, for 11 of the 12 systems that they studied, um, so what we're comparing here is the um, log P value in water-saturated octanol versus log P in, in pure octanol. And essentially what happened is if you were to predict log P using pure octanol, so if you were just to um, compute the transfer free energy from water to pure octanol as compared to the transfer free energy from uh, water or to water saturated octanol, remembering log P is related to the negative of that, is when they looked at pure octanol, right? So when they effectively moved water from that octanol rich phase, they increased the affinity for that octanol phase, right? So the affinity for the solute increased for the organic phase, the octanol phase, uh, when they essentially looked at pure octanol compared to water saturated octanol. All right, so you know, building off of, of this work of C and Sandler, so next we want to look at predicting octanol water partition coefficients using molecular simulation. And so when we perform, um, you know, simulations, right? So you, we likewise try and go for you know this indirect approach. Okay, um, part of our motivation is a little different. Whenever I'm performing a simulation, um, having a model and interface, uh, if can be avoided, is highly desirable. Right? Um, but so if we you know, take this picture from our thermodynamic cycle that we had from the C and Sandler um, case, okay, when we perform a simulation, effectively what changes is we, instead of having in uh, pure liquid one as a reference state, we take as a reference state an ideal gas. And so the thermodynamic cycle that we typically use when we perform our simulations is we adopt this common reference state of an ideal gas. And so we'll calculate the transfer free energy of taking my solute from an ideal gas to my octanol rich phase, which is equivalent to solvation free energy. 
and we'll also calculate the transfer free energy of taking my solute uh, from an ideal gas phase to uh, pure water, right? Which again is equivalent to uh, solvation free energy. So if I complete, so using my thermodynamic cycle, right? Using this thermodynamic path, my transfer free energy from water to my octanol rich phase is nothing more than the difference in solvation free energy in my um, uh, octanol rich phase relative to, to water. Okay. So I can relate the transfer free energy now to difference in two solvation free energies. Okay. So we've, you know, adopted this indirect approach, right? Main motivation is whenever performing a simulation, it's highly desirable to avoid an interface if I can. But then also we have those same challenges of, you know, equilibration time and we're going to throw into it then system size if we were to try and explicitly um, look at modeling um, that system directly. Okay, so my log P, right, again, is directly related to my transfer free energy, which we would get as a difference in two solvation free energies. Okay, now the challenge though, right, is when I'm drawing this cycle, right, this transfer free energy and going from an ideal gas to my octanol rich phase, right, this still corresponds, right, or this is going to correspond to water saturated octanol, right, there's going to be water in that octanol rich phase, right, if I'm trying to quantitatively model, or if I'm trying to model the same physical system that I would have from a shake blast experiment, right, that octanol rich phase isn't pure octanol, there's going to be water in there, okay, and so, you know, modeling this octanol rich phase, right, has challenges from a simulation perspective, Right. And, you know, one some from Michael Schertz's uh, talk yesterday, sampling's a challenge. Right. So when I have a water saturated octanol, I've got to deal with issues of microscale heterogeneity. And so these microscale heterogeneities are going to create a more complicated uh, configurational space, which I would need to explore when computing that solvation free energy. Right. I need to explore or sample all of the important configurational space of that solute and that solvent, right, which is now more complicated. And then I have water in my octanol rich phase. And the dynamics of that system, if I'm performing MD, are going to be uh, very sluggish. Okay. To further complicate, you know, the matter. Okay. So, you know, the... If I were to model, you know, octanol or water saturated octanol, right? If I want to use or treat it as is is a water saturated octanol, uh, the next question is, you know, what concentration of water do I use, right? And, and the issue is, is that is going to be highly dependent on on your model, right? And you know, the models that you're using aren't necessarily going to reproduce the experimental values, okay? And, you know, should emphasize here, we're talking about liquid-liquid equilibrium. So even from a classical thermodynamic modeling perspective, you know, the ability to quantitatively model liquid-liquid equilibrium accurately is extremely complicated and challenging, right? Because you have two highly non-ideal liquids in equilibrium with each other. And so uh, in this work by uh, Chen and Seatman, uh, which we'll refer to in the next few slides, they performed rigorous Gibbs ensemble Monte Carlo calculations to predict the mutual solubility of water and octanol, right? To model this system in, in atomistic detail. And so, you know, if we take so the, the reference value of, of octanol and water that I'll use is, is 0 .20, 0 0.207 mole frax, and that's the value that Decima recommends. Um, if I were to look at, you know, so they considered a combination of TIP4P for water with TRAP UA, which are the models they developed. They get very close. They get 0.21 mole frax, right? And so TRAP UA is optimized for phase equilibrium. And so it's not too surprising that it does a, a very good job. But if they had instead used the OPLS United Atom model, so if they took a different model off the shelf, right, we see the predictions are uh, much different, right? They would predict a mutual solubility of, of water and octanol of 0.09 mole frax. And if they were to look at SPC with Gromos 96, it's, it's 0.16, right? And so there's this challenge then of even if I wanted to model octanol rich water of, you know, there's going to be the sensitivity of the actual value, right, of, of how much water you would have in that octanol rich phase is going to be sensitive to your model, right? And yes, you could just use the experimental mutual solubility and, and run your calculation, but the challenge is, is if I were to use a mole frac of uh, 0 0.20, if I were to use 0 0.207 um, mole fracs of water, right? So if I performed a simulation and I modeled my octanol rich phase as having a, a mole frac of water of 0 0.207, the issue is, is that concentration is greater than that, say, predicted by TIP4P with OPLS United Atom. 
So if I were trying to model my system with these two force fields, in theory, right, my system would, would be a correspond to a metastable state, right? So it's going to be a metastable system then that I'm, I'm actually modeling because I have a concentration greater than, you know, the mutual solubility as predicted by that actual model. Now, you might not actually notice, you know, this uh, when you're running your simulation because due to finite times and finite system sizes, you know, you're not going to see phase separation, right? But in theory, that's what should happen, right? You have a concentration greater than that mutual solubility, right? That system should split to form uh, two phases, okay? So the challenge is, is even if you use experimental conditions, which, which people have, um, is whether or not that's, you know, theoretically correct and is something you should do. Okay. And so what's often done in simulations is people or folks typically, you know, approximate this transfer-free energy. Um, and what they do is in, instead of performing transfer free energies from, you know, an ideal gas to water saturated octanol, they typically just treat that octanol rich phase as, as pure octanol. Okay. And so typically if I want to, um, you know, predict log P using simulations, right? I would uh, perform a solvation free energy calculation in pure octanol and pure water and take that difference uh, to be my estimate of my transfer free energy uh, and my log P. Okay, so by using pure octanol, all right, so sampling is improved. So we still have a complex, complicated solvent that we need to sample, but it's not quite as complex as, as if I were to add water to it. I avoid these issues with the actual mutual solubility predicted by the model, right? And you know, one might argue that maybe I don't care about experiments, right? Maybe the fact that octanol is saturated with water, maybe that's a limitation of shake flask, right? So maybe um, by having just pure octanol, it's a better representation of my system. And so there's been, you know, many accurate and, and excellent predictions using simulations. Um, but again, you know, the shortcomings are going to be if, if we're trying to quantitatively compare to our experiments, well, experimentally, they're treating that octanol rich phase as being saturated with water. And we know the octanol is not pure, right? And we would expect then that there's going to be uh, some sort of quantitative difference, right? So C and Sandler showed that there's a quantitative uh, difference uh, when they uh, linear cooked up their, their linear correlation. All right, so next we're going to look at uh, neat versus water um, saturated octanol and some predictions we, we have in there. All right, so um, the main paper that um, that does it, the, the paper, there, there's uh, only a limited number of papers that have looked at uh, neat versus water saturated octanol. Okay, the, the main one that, that we'll refer to uh, is by uh, Chen and Seatman. Okay. And so in the this work by Chen and Seatman, they performed rigorous uh, Gibbs Ensemble Monte Carlo uh, simulations to rigorously model the mutual solubility of their TIP 4P, uh, unit, or TIP, yeah, TIP 4P. So this should be uh, the TRAP UA octanal model with their TIP 4P um, water model. So they performed rigorous Gibbs Ensemble Monte Carlo calculations to model the mutual solubility of their trap UA octanol model uh, with tip 4P water. Okay, and again, in their calculations, they they were able to predict the mutual solubility of, of that model is, is 0.21 mole frax, which is in pretty good agreement with experiment. Okay, but then looking at the, the structure of what's the difference between um, neat octanol and water saturated octanol. So in both neat octanol and water saturated octanol, right, what you end up with is, so if you just picture octanol, right, so you have a carbon chain of length N with a hydroxyl group on, so you have this polar tail, this hydroxyl group, or maybe you call it a head. So you have a polar group as your head, an OH group as a head, then you have this long nonpolar tail, right, this, you know, um, C8 chain. Right? And, and that's where, you know, essentially this is, you know, used to mimic these, these intercellular materials. Right? And so you might picture that if I have a system of octanol that, you know, my um, these polar head groups are going to solvate them, themselves. Right. So you'll end up with these polar domains um, in your system. And then you'll end up with these nonpolar domains where you end up with these, you know, C8 chains um, sticking out from that polar region. And then, you know, it'll repeat. So when I have both neat octanol and, and water saturated octanol, right, I have this situation in which I end up with microscale heterogeneities in which I have polar domains and non-polar domains uh, in my system. And so what happens is when you add water to octanol, the size of these polar domains increases, okay? So the size of the polar domains increases, 
so, and so how they characterized it in the statement paper is that they showed um, that the size of these hydrogen bond aggregates, so a hydrogen bond aggregate, they defined as being, um, you know, grouping in which, you know, all molecules, right, in that group um, participate in a hydrogen bond, right? And so what they find is as they add water, right, or when you add water to your system, these polar domains uh, increase, right? You have these larger um, hydrogen bond aggregates that are formed, okay? So polar domains are increasing, right? And it's, you know, as we would expect, right? And so if I think about the density of just say OH in uh, my system, right? The, the molar density of, you know, OH is, is increasing when I add water to my system. Okay, um, and then of course the other result that we've mentioned already that they hit at is that the mutual solubility is uh, sensitive to that force field combination. Okay. All right, so what we're going to look at next are some results looking at the effect of water saturation um, from the sample six blind um, prediction challenge, right? And so uh, the sample challenge is a challenge that's organized yearly um, by um, a group from the computer-aided drug discovery community, which is interested in you know an authentic assessment of state-of-the-art methods, um, the accuracy of state-of-the-art methods for applications in uh, computer-aided drug discovery. And so the, the first set of results um, aren't gonna be ours. They're gonna be from the, the challenge organizers in, in sample six. Okay. But here's the uh, 11 molecules uh, from sample six in which we were asked to make blind predictions of log P. Okay, and in sample six, the challenge organizers, um, you know, pose this question of what's the effect of you know, model eight octanol is pure octanol, they're water saturated octanol. And in their work, they use the uh, experimental uh, mutual solubility of, of water and octanol. Okay. And for the sample six challenge, they, they did this, right? And so the log P values, the experimental log P's, right? Span this range of 1.94 to 4.09. So just like C and Sandler, these are cases in which we have log P's um, greater than zero. So there's preference for my octanol rich phase. And so they found when they added um, water, so they modeled that octanol rich phase as being water saturated. You know, the root mean squared error is compared to experiments, you know, changed very little. Um, and if the, you know, choice of method and force field had a greater effect. And when they looked at just the difference between um, their log P's in pure octanol using pure octanol and water saturated octanol, the average difference between their values was just 0 0.03 log units. Um, the average absolute difference is, is 0.25 log units, right? And so this average absolute difference, or root, you know, so essentially the root mean squared error comparing using pure octanol and water saturated octanol is, is very similar to what C and Sandler had. Only in this case, you know, the effect of water in some cases, you know, increased log P and other cases it decreased. So if I ignored the sign, right, then um, the effect becomes much smaller. And so, you know, essentially for sample six, right, for these molecules, what they found is that when they added water to their octanol rich phase, when they attempted to use um, the model octanol as water saturated octanol, that the impact of water was, was really quite small, that um, the much greater effect was the choice of force field and the method used to predict that solvation free energy. And so that brings us to sample seven. Okay, and so what I want to look at in, in the sample six molecules, okay, the main thing I want to look at and highlight is blue, all right, and red, right? Because if I look at my sample six molecules, so blue and red are going to indicate, you know, sites in my molecules, which I expect to be capable of donating uh, and or accepting hydrogen bonds, right? So here I have, so if I look at SO9, I have a single, well, I have an O acceptor. Uh, have an amine, right? And then these two uh, aromatic nitrogens, right? So blues and reds are going to correspond to sites that could participate in, in hydrogen bonding. So then sample seven came out and sample seven had 22 molecules that were provided by GSK. Um, and they was essentially the, the physical property portion was, was one and the same, you know, predict log P for these 22 molecules. And so when we looked at, um, the 22 molecules provided by GSK, all right, immediately what stood out to us is, well, there's there's more reds and blues here, right? So there's more red and blue um, in, in our pictures. And so for sample seven, we'd expect that hydrogen bonding 
uh, is going to be more important. Okay, so we expect hydrogen bonding to be more important or to have a larger role in the solvation of these compounds. Okay, and now thinking about that Seatman paper and the effect of water saturation in octanol. Okay, when I add water, right, when I have water saturated octanol compared to pure octanol, what happens is when I add water, the size of my polar domains increases. All right, so when we saw the molecules come out for sample seven, our hypothesis was, well, hydrogen bonding is going to be more important in these molecules, all right? So we would expect that the, you know, effect of having water-saturated octanol is going to be larger. And so what we did is we said, okay, so we expect this to be the case. Let's, let's test it out. And so what we did for um, sample seven is we looked at the effect of pure water versus water-saturated octanol. Um, when we modeled octanol in water, we modeled water with TIP4P and octanol using TRAP UA. Reason being is that's the force field combination used by Chen and Seatman. So we knew that the mutual solubility, the rigorous mutual solubility given by that model is 0.21 mole fracs. So when we modeled um, pure or water saturated octanol, we knew right what the model's predicted concentration of water should be. Right, so we can use you know correct conditions uh, for that model, and so we set up our systems right for water, octanol, water saturated octanol. Uh, we had cubic boxes with box lengths of about 4.5 nanometers. Um, we also looked at TIP4P 2005 after the close of sample seven, just to look at the effect of, of solvent uh, or water model. Um, but these were all performed with Gromax, um, and we used you know sufficient times to to make sure we had these systems converged. Okay, and so to look at the results, right? So what we have is, is here we have our, um, you know, sample seven molecules again. And what I have plotted here is this is the octanol water partition coefficient we would predict using water saturated octanol. So that solvation free energy in octanol, here I have in using uh, water saturated octanol. Um, so that log P relative to the log P that I would have if I treated um, octanol is, is pure. Okay. So the difference in water saturated versus pure um, octanol uh, predicted log P's. Okay. And so the top pane. So for the most part, so if I go back here, right, I, I you know, highlight TIP 4P trap UA because unless otherwise noted, right, the results that we're going to discuss will involve TIP 4P and, and trap UA. And so when I when I look at my plot, right? So the first thing is, so my triangles correspond to the LJ contribution, right? So my LJ contribution to these two log Ps, the difference in those two, right? And then ultimately this difference you could relate back to the solvation free energy um, in pure octanol relative to water saturated octanol. And so what we find, right, is that the LJ contribution to this difference uh, is essentially zero, right? So the uh, LJ contribution is insignificant, right? So the difference in the LJ contribution in what octanol uh, versus pure octanol is, is minu. Okay. So the major effect is due to electrostatic interactions, right? And so black triangles correspond to electrostatic interactions, which for the most part, right, um, you can't see because my total um, contribution or my total uh, difference is overlapping with that electrostatic contribution. So in general, right, the, the dominant effect is uh, due to electrostatic interactions, right? And that's as we'd expect, right? So we said in water-saturated octanol, we're going to have larger polar domains, right? And we see that play out here into the major effect is due to electrostatic interactions, okay? And so if I look at TIP4P of our 22 molecules, okay, for all but two of them, right, what we find is when we add water um, to our octanol-rich phase, Okay. So when we add water to our octanol rich phase, the log P increases relative to the case of having pure octanol. Okay. So adding water, right? So, so if I were to look at the affinity of my solute for pure octanol relative to water, right? And then the affinity of my solute for water saturated octanol relative to water, we see that the affinity for water saturated octanol is greater than for pure octanol, right? And so these are all going to be molecules that have a positive log P, right? Which would indicate a preference for octanol. 
And what we find here is that the addition of octanol or water in my octanol rich phase actually increases the affinity for all but two of those of the solutes for that octanol rich phase. Right? There's two that have the opposite effect, which we'll um, look at one of them momentarily, right? But in general, here the effect of water is we actually increase the affinity um, for that octanol rich phase. Okay. All right. And so, you know, looking at quantitative results, right? So log p range, experimental log p range. So the sample six molecules right, span the range 1.94 to 4.09. For sample seven, the experimental log p's actually span a smaller range, 0.58 to 0.296. And so while those work, the um, values from Mobley and coworkers, if we look at the average difference and average absolute difference, and sample six, right, the average difference is 0 0.03 and absolute difference is 0.25. If I compare that to what we have here, right, the average absolute difference is much larger uh, for sample seven, almost three times larger. Um, and then when I look at the, you know, unsigned error, right, it's also larger here. It's closer to the average absolute error. And that's just because, well, in sample six, right, in some cases, log P increased, other cases it decreased. Here, for the most part, log P is, is increasing when I have water um, compared to pure octanol. Okay. And when I look at the individual contributions, right, the LJ contribution is rather small, right, the dominant effect is due to electrostatics. Okay. All right, so to, to investigate this further, right, we're going to look at, um, in the next few slides, sample or molecule 33, 36, and 39. Okay. And so when I look at 33, 36, and 39, right, when I break them out, Okay. The main difference that we're going to have is if I look at this um, ring here, right? So if I look at this four-membered ring, here I just have a sulfur, here I have a sulfur double bonded to an oxygen, and here I have a sulfur double bonded to two oxygens. Okay. When I look at these on our plot that we just looked at in terms of looking at the difference um, of water-saturated octanol versus pure octanol, okay, here's SM33, here's 36, and here's 39. Okay. And so focus on these three. The reason for looking at these three is 36 is the case where water saturation has the greatest effect. Okay. okay. So greatest effect in terms of increasing um, log P relative to need octanol. 33 is when the effect is, you know, the smallest, right? Or the most negative. And it's the most in the opposite direction. And 36 sits right in between, right? So 33 and 36 are going to correspond to two opposite ends of the spectrum, where the only real difference is uh, my, my ring group here, where I have sulfur, and then I have sulfur double bonded to an oxygen. And so what we'll look at next is we're going to look at um, the structure of these solutes uh, in our solvents. Okay, And so we'll look at the sulfur in our ring, and then we're also going to look at this uh, amine nitrogen here, N, and we're going to look at the sulfur in the sulfonone group. Okay, we're going to look at, you know, say just S, right? The idea being if my solvent's hydrogen bonded to, say, this oxygen, it would still appear in that local density around S just due to fixed geometry. All right, and so what we're looking at first is we're looking at um, local densities, right? So we're not looking at RDF. So an RDF would correspond to my local density normalized to bulk. Here we're looking at the local density. Reason for looking at local density is you know kind of the picture of when I have water saturated octanol. Okay, what's the effect of adding water? Right, effectively the the effect is I'm increasing uh, the density of hydroxyl groups in my my system. Right, I'm adding more hydroxyl groups to that system. And so, if we were to normalize the RDFs, right, you know, the interesting results actually get muted. Um, you know, we want to be able to look at what's the effect of adding more OHs. Are those OHs drawn to my um, solute. So in the first case, we have SM33, right? So this was that one case where um, log P in, in neat octanol was actually greater than in water saturated octanol, right? Where the effect of adding water to octanol made it less attractive to my solute. And so, you know, what we have here is, you know, um, the bottom line. So I'm looking at um, local density. So inverse nanometers cubed is a function of distance. So black line corresponds to the, the sulfur in my ring, uh, or the red line corresponds to my sulfur in my ring. The black line is the sulfur for my sulfonone group, and N is this, this amine group here. Okay, so in water, right, nothing too interesting happens. 
All right, if I was looking at you know RDF, which is normalized relative to bulk, all right, this wouldn't look like this wouldn't look all that uh, exciting. Okay, all right, and so when I look at though um, my solute in octanol, right, so what I have here is my solid lines corresponding to neat octanol, my dotted line corresponds to um, water saturated octanol. Okay, so in SM33, there isn't much of a difference in my local densities when I have neat versus water saturated octanol. And what this arrow is pointing to is if, you know, specifically I look at sulfur in this ring, right? And why sulfur in this ring is that's where we're getting a difference between 33 and 36 and 39, right? It's my peak heights, it's, it's rather low, right? And when I compare red to blue, right, the change in local density around that ring is really small. But now what happens is when I look at 36 and now this sulfur, right, has a double bonded oxygen to it, okay, uh, plots the same. So now when I look at water, right, so now this red here, right, which corresponds to water around the sulfur in that ring, right, this peak is, is now, you know, noticeably larger compared to that bulk local density. So it looks like I have water, right, interacting with that oxygen. And then the biggest difference is now if I look at the case of um, neat octanol versus saturated octanol, so if I were to look at the amine, right? So neat octanol is this, this orange, saturated octanol is this, this dotted line here, all right? They look pretty much the same. If I were to look at the sulfone group, right? There's not too much of a difference here, um, but the big difference I have is, is with the ring, right? So considering that sulfur uh, in the ring, this red curve here corresponds to local density of hydroxyl groups around that sulfur, okay? In neat octanol. And then blue corresponds to local density of OH groups, right, of oxygen around that sulfur group in water saturated octanol, right? And so when I'm talking about NEAT versus SAT, right, what I'm looking at is local density of oxygen or right, the solvent oxygen around those sites. And I don't differentiate between octanol and water because, again, the effect of adding water to my solvent is I'm increasing the density, the overall density of hydroxyls, of OH groups in that solvent. And so what we find is when we add water, right, we get this very noticeable difference in the local density of hydroxyl groups around that sulfur, All right? So, you know, here, right, I have this, you know, hydrogen bond uh, accepting site. And the effect is when I add water to my octanol rich phase, um, I have an increased concentration of hydroxyls around that sulfur. Okay, which ultimately leads to more favorable solvation of that solute in water saturated octanol compared to neat octanol, which leads to an increase in log P when I have water saturated octanol versus versus neat. Okay. If I were to look at 39, right, we'll spend just a second at 39. Again, 39 falls in the middle of 33 and, and 36, right? So if I look at that sulfur ring, um, I get a slight increase, right? Not quite as you know great as with 36. Right. So the change in intensity is not as much. Right. And the width isn't as great. So that number of hydroxyls around sulfur isn't as much. But I guess you would expect that um, looking at SO compared to SO2. Okay. All right. So coming back to 33 and 36. OK. Um, so just by, you know, looking at, you know, this molecule, which for all intents and purposes, we can think of as being identical save for the substitution of the sulfur in this ring, right? And you get very different uh, effects of adding water um, to that octanol rich phase, okay? If we were to look at just the solutes in neat octanol, so here's an SDF, so here's um, SM33. So what I'm looking at, or what I wanna focus in on is sulfur in this ring, right? So in, in the SDFs, the red in neat octanol corresponds to um, O, and hydroxyl oxygen. Blue is corresponding to the center of geometry of my um, carbon chain. And so what I see is if I look at the sulfur ring, right, there's no hydroxyls, you know, present, right? There's the, the uh, concentration of hydroxyls is, is rather small. And what I instead have is a halo um, of these nonpolar groups. Whereas when I look at 36, even in neat octanol, Right now, I have a halo of hydroxyls around that sulfur oxygen, right? And so that small little change has a huge effect on log P, right? And comparing log P predicted using neat and saturated, right, has a has a very large pronounced effect. OK, 
Okay. Uh, and if we were to even look at a snapshot, so zooming in here, all right, so sample 30 or molecule 33, there's no hydroxyls around in need octanol. We're here in this, uh, you know, you know, no closest plane, right? Here's a, in this snapshot, you can readily see octanol hydrogen bonding with um, the SO group. All right, um, and so, you know, again, here's sample 33, 36, and 39. Now all I'm plotting is the difference in local density of hydroxyls around the sulfur, my sulfonone group, my sulfur ring and nitrogen. And in 36, right, again, the, the biggest effect is we see this largest or larger change in local density compared to my other cases. Okay. So, you know, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. So how do we do? Um, so, you know, it, it is a little interesting, right? So if I look at my parity plots, they're, they're not the greatest, right? But, you know, part of, you know, the issue with our study is a real um, a real goal was looking at the effect of water saturation in octanol. So the most important thing to me was making sure we could accurately model water saturated octanol. And so that essentially restricted us to looking at this combination of TIP4P with TRAP UA, so that I knew that I was using a correct value of the mutual solubility for that system. Okay. And then we threw, we use GAF for my solute because TRAP can't model um, our solutes. And so interestingly, so in the sample challenge, so ch uh, sample, you submit your predictions, and then the organizers independently evaluate your results and release the data uh, after the study closes. Um, so for need octanol, we had a root mean squared error of 1.08, which ranked us number one out of 10 entries in this physical molecular mechanics category. Uh, when we added water to our octanol rich phase, our root mean squared error compared to experiment actually increased, and we dropped down to you know six out of ten in in the rankings. Um, when we did use TIP4P 2005 after the study closed, okay, using need octanol, the root mean squared error didn't change too much. Uh, and interestingly, when I looked at water saturated octanol, right, the difference wasn't quite as large. But the, the main you know, result or, or finding from the study is that the effect of water saturation is not negligible. All right. So, you know, the difference in log P predicted using, you know, modeling octanols being um, water saturated versus pure uh, is not negligible. Right. It's it's significant. Right. And important. Right. Both quantitatively and physically, uh, it's different. And so the biggest thing is when I add water to my octanol rich phase, effectively what I'm doing is I'm increasing the concentration of hydroxyls in that phase. So by adding water to that octanol rich phase, I'm effectively increasing the concentration of hydroxyls um, in that. And so that results in, and the, the net effect is we increase the size of the polar domains um, in that solvent. Um, so we end up, we still have polar and non-polar domains. It's just the size of those polar domains uh, increases. Another important result is that the effect of water saturation is solute dependent. So if I just look at sample 33 compared to um, 36, where I have a very small difference in the structure of those molecules, we end up with a very large difference, right, in the effect of water saturation uh, in my calculations, right? So the predicted log P or that delta log P value and the difference between the two of them, when I compare the two is on the order of uh, three log units, um, which definitely is not uh, negligible. Okay, so choice of force field is important, um, but water saturation uh, is not negligible. And so just a couple of few comments, because um, they're bought out of time, is you know, just to touch on some ongoing developments or to give you some more things to think about, is if you go back to that work of um, Sandler and coworkers, okay, so if we you know, applied under this lens of, of the results from sample seven, is you know, they found that this correlation worked. But again, right, they were applying to 12 organic pollutants, which consisted of alkanes and chloroalkanes. So if I have solutes that are alkanes and, and chloroalkanes, right, which all have, you know, positive log P's, which means an affinity for that octanol rich phase over water, right, the picture I would have in my head is that those aren't solutes that are going to be able to participate in hydrogen bonding, right? So if I picture um, octanol as, as being composed of polar and nonpolar domains, right, well, I would expect this to, say, sit in my polar domain, right, or my Sorry, I would expect these solutes to say sit in our, our nonpolar domain. 
right? They're not going to be able to donate or accept hydrogen bonds, right? And so that effect of water saturation is going to be smaller, right? It's not going to be as significant. And so they were able to correlate, right? But, you know, being able to correlate, right, they were looking at 12 very chemically similar compounds, right, that we'd expect to behave in the same way. And so, you know, you know, we also entered sample six, right? And so um, just this part of the story makes more sense here. Right? And so, um, you know, we originally came upon C and Sandler's, you know, thinking about sample six and how can we try and incorporate the effect of water saturation. And what we did there is, you know, we, we took our sample molecules, okay? And what we did is um, we, we essentially followed what C and Sandler did, right? But instead, what we did is we computed, we predicted solvation free energies. I didn't use molecular simulation here. We used electronic structure calculations in the SMD, SM8, and SM12 continuum solvents. Motivation being is we want to do lots of solvation free energy calculations. And so these were a little more efficient for high throughput. And so what we did is trying to follow C and Sandler is we created a training set of 100 molecules. So we went to drugbank.ca. And we search for molecules that contain this four amino quinazoline scaffold that all of our sample molecules had. Then we wanted to make sure we had log P's available. And we were looking for molecules of comparable size and weights, uh, and also looking for molecules that included halogens and other electronegative elements. All right, so we searched this database to try and find data that at the time we thought was you know, representative of our solutes. We collected that data perform solvation free energy calculations in water and octanol for these 100 compounds, and then use the experimental log P's to back out essentially, you know, an experimental transfer free energy and tried to come up with a similar correlation um, like C and Sandler had. And what we found interestingly is that when we trained on these 100 molecules and I tried to make predictions for those 11 sample molecules, that our trained predictions were actually worse um, than our untrained predictions, right? And, you know, kind of now in the, the light of sample seven, so in sample six, it wasn't completely obvious why this was the case, right? But after sample seven, right, the rationale that I would assign to it is that the effect of water saturation is solute dependent. So those 100 compounds, right, that we source from drug bank, right, were very chemically diverse, right? So yes, they contained that four amino quinosaline scaffold, but otherwise, right, we really didn't look at or focus on what other functional groups are present in that molecule, right? And so the, you know, when we tried to come up with this correlation, right, it's really hard to come up with the correlation, right? The, the correlation wasn't very good, right? And part of that is, is the effect of water saturation, right, is going to be solute dependent, right? And so if I have a very diverse set of compounds, right, such a linear co correlation becomes challenging or problematic. Okay. And so one thing we're looking at uh, now to, to try and overcome that, so an undergrad in my group, Jasmine, is, is okay, the effect of water saturation solute dependent. So what we've done is we've sourced a, a training set of um, over 1,800 experimental log P's. And so what we're doing is instead of assuming this linear relationship, um, can I assume that the difference between my you know rigorous transfer free energy and that in pure octanol, using pure octanol, um, that that's some sort of function of the structure of my solute. And so we've coded up 68 structural um, uh, groups. Um, we've coded them up as smart descriptors so we could tag our molecules in Babel. Um, and we've been playing around with using uh, neural networks to try and um, come up with a mechanism to predict that, that deviation. Um, another thing just to think about, right, as they wrap up is, so protonation, deprotonation, and, and tautomers, oh, oh my, right? And so another thing that, that we have to keep in mind is when I talk about a partition coefficient here, right, what I'm referring to is a transfer of a neutral species, right, between water and octanol, right? I'm assuming that I have some neutral species, right? I have an equilibrium between, you know, the distribution of a neutral species between octanol uh, and water. Okay, so when I measure log P, I'm looking at the relative concentration of that neutral species in the two phases. So, you know, one last food for thought is if I think of this pure water rich phase is, you know, what could happen in, in water, right? If I just take H2A to represent my um, neutral solute of interest, 
right? It could be that in water, right, maybe I'm uh, deprotonated, right? Maybe I give up a hydrogen. Maybe I'm protonated. Maybe I gain a hydrogen from water. Um, maybe I have some equilibrium between my neutral species and some sort of tautomer in which my, you know, hydrogen has just moved to a different location, right? But the net charge is made the same. Maybe I'm doubly deprotonated. Maybe I give up two hydrogens, right? Maybe I gain, um, you know, uh, well, not just one hydrogen. Maybe this should be H4A2+, right? Maybe I gain two hydrogens, right? And so the issue is, is in water, right? There's this possibility of water facilitating a movement of hydrogen within my molecule, right? Forming different tautomers. But then also just, you know, the ability of that cellular to, you know, be protonated and deprotonated altogether. And what would happen now is if I'm looking at the equilibrium, right, between that solute and these two phases. Now, if I have in my water-rich phase, you know, uh, essentially a reaction or an equilibrium between my neutral species and all of these other possible states, okay, what that would do is effectively decrease, right, if you will, the concentration of my neutral species, right, and drive, um, you know, it, it, drive my affinity or increase my affinity towards towards water, right, in terms of establishing that equilibrium between um, my neutral, okay? And so the difference, um, so log D, right, is essentially, if I assume that, you know, octanol, nothing uh, special happens, right, it's concentration of that neutral species in octanol, but now I need to account for all concentrations of my, um, all forms of my species in, in water, and the difference between those two, right, is could be related to the, the delta G of reaction, essentially, um, of that species and my neutral species and these different forms that could um, form. Okay. But that's all I have, all right, for my talk. So hopefully you, you found it interesting. Um, and so the uh, work that I shared with you is, was performed by two undergraduate students. Um, so that main work with Spencer Sabatino um, in the sample six work and um, ongoing work with, with Jasmine. Um, and so, you know, it's all been done with undergrads. And so I'd like to acknowledge use of uh, the Ohio Supercomputing Center for Computing Resources. And with that, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. And, you know, you're, you're also more than welcome to send me an email if you have any questions or would like to have any uh, conversations about this um, in the future. Okay, so thank you. So with that, I'll stop sharing so I can... Um, see you and would be happy to, to answer uh, any questions you might have. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much for your talking. It was very interesting. A lot of information that are very crucial to, 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 to the, the problems in chemistry. So this is, I would say, the core of chemistry. In particular, uh, it was very interesting to see an, an interpretation at the molecular level of the, some results you have. Huh? Okay, we have here a lot of questions. I ask uh, Mateus. Mateus is the, our coordinator to upload the the, the, the quest in sequence one after one, and you could you could uh, read it, Andrew. Yes, yes. So Luciano asks. So, um, yes. so asking about cavity formation. So cavity formation is is a good one, and um, I, I, so I, I guess I, I didn't show um, you know as many pictures as I might like, and and so you know I, I'll have to say this work with Spencer was done, you know, while we were at home in quarantine during COVID. So this was kind of fun and, and turned into being a lot more fun uh, than, than we had ever imagined. And so more so than cavity formation, what, what effectively we found happens is when I have these multifunctional solutes in octanol is again, in octanol, the picture you should have is that you have polar domains and nonpolar domains. And essentially what happens is when I look at some of these multifunctional compounds is they try to arrange themselves in octanol so that, you know, what would be ideal is if I could put the polar part of my, you know, molecule in that polar domain and keep, say, the nonpolar regions, right, in that nonpolar domain, right, to try and minimize the effect of, you know, breaking up these hydrogen bonds in, in my structured system. And so it's, what we found is it's, it's a little, it's a little more complicated um, than just breaking up hydrogen bonds. And I guess what I'll, the one point I would make is, Compared to Geraldo, when I look at the difference in, you know, log P predicted using water saturated octanol and pure octanol, effectively what I'm evaluating the difference in is the solvation free energy in, you know, that water saturated octanol rich phase and water um, uh, in pure octanol. And so 
you know, it's not the you know destruction of the hydrogen bonding network of water. What we more so find it to be is when that polar domain increases. Um, so if I were to look at one of these sample molecules, right, I can solvate my um, sulfur group and the SO group that increased the polar domain around that sulfur. And then what also happened then is as that radius increased, right, it was able to additionally solvate my um, NH and SO2 groups uh, even better, right? And so it's it, it's a it's a little different because it's a little more of a of a dance, <laughs> uh, if you will. Okay, there is a second question from Sean about the use of machine learning. Right, so, so that's a good question. And, and so essentially that's what we're trying to do in this later work is, is okay, if we're to try and follow this work of C and Sandler, right, the difference or the effect of water saturation is going to be, is unique to the solute. So we assume it's structurally dependent. And so what we've been trying to do is use machine learning to essentially try and learn uh, what that structural dependence is so that we can create some sort of predicted method um, like that. So um, that's a fantastic idea. Now, I will say we've, we've done work where, you know, we've just used plain old machine learning, if you will, for lack of a better word, to correlate log P's. And that works great. Um, but what I like about combining machine learning with simulation or these SMX solvation models is the benefit of, you know, simulation, in, in my opinion, is it gives you some physical insight into that system, right? Where if I just do machine learning, so I was always hesitant of adopting machine learning, right? The issue is, is one, I'm old, right? But the other issue is, is if I train, um, say, neural net, whether it be Python, R, or MATLAB, right? I don't have an equation, right? I, I have you know, some sort of program where in goes, inputs, outcomes, output, right? And so, you know, kind of thinking about old school property predictions, you kind of lose that uh, feeling, if you will. And so that's why I like combining it with simulation is that we can use our simulation to still gain that physical insight in terms of trying to understand what's going on, but then using machine learning to feel out that correctional term um, for quantitative predictions. Okay, there are now two questions from Ednilson Orestes. The first one is about the linear relationship, about the delta G uh, values for, for, for pure octanol and rich octanol. You use so that, that's a good question. So um, in that work of C and Sandler, in, um, I haven't seen too many places where people have tried this, but that work in C and Sandler, they looked at 12 compounds, uh, alkanes and chloroalkanes. It worked well. And so where I think that this linear correlation works is if you're looking at chemically similar molecules, All right. So, you know, I don't know if you had a group of alcohols, right? If you're trying to look, you know, correlate log P of alcohols in um, neat octanol versus wet octanol, you know, maybe it would work, right? So if I have you know, similar solutes, then this seems like it's an approach that, that could work. But as soon as you start to get, you know, some sort of uh, variation in your solutes, it becomes a lot harder to just correlate this with a simplified uh, model. And so, you know, even just looking at that, uh, you know, molecule 33 and 36, we're at a single hydroxyl group, right? So, if I'm looking at those two molecules, I say, yeah, they look they look pretty similar, right? Or even if I have SO versus SO2, yeah, those look similar to me. But quantitatively, the effect is is huge, right? And so once you start to get some variation in the structure, a lot of these, you know, simple correlations start to break down. And that's where I think, you know, Luciano is, you know, right on the right page is if there's some structural differences, can we use machine learning instead to um, try and feel it out? How well that does, uh, you know, we have... We have results so far. So we've looked at SM12, SM8, and SMD. Um, and we get significant improvements, I would say, in our quantitative prediction of log P when we uh, add on this correctional term. Um, I guess we're still trying to make uh, sense of everything, right? And then what really needs to be done is the sample challenge comes out every year. And that would be the you know kind of you know best place to to test some of these methods out in terms of getting a, an authentic assessment for, for real systems. Okay, in the second question from Ed News, it's just about the three molecules that there is, is this, the sulfur substituents, which is no oxygen, one oxygen, and two oxygen atoms. It is strange because we should expect a, a sequence, huh? but it's not so. Well, so so in terms of the, the extremes of the spectrum, so uh, 33 was, was the far end where log P actually decreased when I added water, right? And so that was just uh, sulfur in that four membered ring. 36 had the biggest effect, right? When I had an SO. And then SO2 
when I had SO2, it, it fell in between, right? And, and what actually happens is when I just have S double bonded to an oxygen, right? That's actually very similar to DMSO, right? And so when you look at the dipole between that sulfur oxygen, when I have one oxygen compared to, you know, sulfur and, and two oxygens, is you have a much larger dipole in that single oxygen case, which leads to much stronger uh, hydrogen bond formation, right? And so it's just, yes, right? So when I have two oxygens, right, um, log P increases when I add water because I have hydrogen bonding. The difference is, is the strength of hydrogen bonding between water and that single oxygen is much greater than when I have two. Is it that in, in relation with the bonding order in the sulfur oxygen bonding order? So, um, so it, so when I have SO, right, it's sulfur double bonded to an oxygen. Um, so one, remember, I'm a chemical engineer, not a chemist. So, <laughs> so when you have SO2, right, so it's hybridized, right? So, um, you know, you have, you know, sulfur double bonded and oxygen and sulfur, you know, single bonded to an oxygen and yeah. you get hybridization between the two. Um, but it's, you know, the, the dipole. So if I were to look at the dipole between sulfur and those two oxygens in that oh, case, yeah. they're much smaller than when I have sulfur with a single and, double bonded one, oxygen. Single, okay, okay. And so... Yeah. It's in in my opinion, it's that you know higher propensity to participate in hydrogen bonding, um, which draws more to it. And again, it's not the SO two. We don't have the effect. It's it's much greater in SO. Okay, and and there is another question from Raul. It's it's just about the dipole moments uh, and the the its effect in the in the simulation. So that's a good question. So we're using rigid <laughs> rigid water models. Um, so we can't look at, you know, the change in dipole in water when you have, you know, you know pure water versus water saturated octanol. Um, and so, yeah, you know, so what would be best? Hey, let's use polarized models for water and octanol. Let's use the greatest force fields for um, the solutes. Yeah. So, so I guess kind of where, where we were in this study is based on what's available in the literature is the challenge for us is we wanted to model water saturated octanol. And the challenge with that is that there's only a very limited number of studies where people have rigorously computed the mutual solubility of water and octanol. Why? Because it's incredibly difficult. And in those studies, right, there's huge variations between the models used. And so we used our fixed models, right, because people had studied or actually predicted the mutual solubilities with those models and found good agreement with the experiment. And so I guess what we would need to do or what would be done in the future is if we wanted to try and look at, um, you know, more realistic models, if you will, is the first step would be to try and predict, we'd have to predict the mutual solubility um, of those two, right? To make sure we're looking at physically uh, represented um, conditions. And we've tried doing some of this, um, even just using fixed charge models. We've looked at, so actually the same trap UA with um, TIP4P is when we model the binary systems of water isopropanol, if we do free energy calculations to uh, get delta G of mixing as a function of composition, we would actually predict that that system is uh, metastable, um, that we would predict phase separation. And so, you know, the challenge with a lot of those models is they're parameterized for pure component systems. And so you end up with issues when you apply to mixtures. And so there's lots of work to be done there. Um, our first step was just trying to, you know, get some sort of understanding of what's the difference. And, you know, does that difference uh, change depending on what molecules I'm looking at? Okay. I have one question. Uh, you showed that that the electrostatic interaction are much more relevant than than Leonard John interactions, but you need charge electron charge to compute the electrostatic interaction. Is there a problem with the electron charge? Or so you know again, we're using these fixed charge models, right? And so oh, okay. um, the charges on those solutes are are fixed. Um, so we're not looking at charge transfer or changes in charges of the solutes as a function of environment. Um, none of that's being accounted for. So, I mean, what I, what I interpreted it as is when I look at, you know, these cases of water saturated octanol and have these increased polar domains, right? There's more of my solute that's being, that's being solvated in these polar regions, right? And so that the biggest contribution to that difference is via electrostatic interactions and, and not Leonard Jones. Okay. 
is it possible to, to predict uh, solv uh, solubility? So is it possible to predict solubility? Yeah. So we could. So actually, I'm, I'm very interested in solubility. Um, so, you know, essentially you could say log P is related to relative solubility in octanol relative to water, right? And so you could, you know, expand this out in terms of predicting or ranking solubilities in, in solvents. Um, rigorous solubility predictions is, is a little more challenging. Um, and so we have done some of that. Um, so how we typically approach that is if I want to predict, well, so the first main part there is you need to be able to predict the um, free energy of your crystalline solid, right? So I essentially I predict the chemical potential of my crystalline solid, and then I try and calculate the composition dependence of the chemical potential of my solute and solution and find where those two are equal, right, effectively, right? And similar challenges exist there in that, you know, the you know, we have free energy or we have models that, you know, often do a, a okay job modeling interactions of my solute with my solvent. Okay, that's great. But now I need to actually predict the free energy of that crystalline solid. And, and that becomes a much more challenging problem. Okay, I think there is no question anymore. Oh, uh, somebody wants to have, we have some time. Nothing? Okay, Andrew, once again, thank you very much for your participation. It was very interesting, your talk. We hope that in two years, or it may, it may be less than two years, <laughs> you will be here. Uh, yeah, yeah, first. sounds great. Huh? Sounds great. <laughs> and I, so here in the U.S. tomorrow is Thanksgiving, right? And so again, oh, fantastic yeah. time. So, you know, much yeah. appreciative of, of all the friendship at, uh, at UFI. Okay. Nah. But so at the distance is very, very difficult to take a beer, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so I, I should bring up, I have my pictures of was it, uh, Antarctica, ah, right? So after okay. our celebratory dinner. <laughs> so okay. yeah. yeah, I'll go home and have some kasasha for you. How about that? Yeah, also, yes. We, we can huh? virtually toast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your contribution. No, so people, so people, we are closing the session today. And we'll come uh, back tomorrow at 11 with a round table about the science communication uh, with two experienced people in the field. Okay, thank you very much for your participation, for your uh, attendance. Bye-bye.